Uh, Tim Sheaf here, um, former, for those who are new to this channel, um, I'm former parkour and ninja warrior athlete turned passionate biomechanist operating sort of on the fringe realms of the biomechanics research though. I'm not coming from a traditional route, um, but on that path, it le leads me to look at many different systems. And one of those that it led me to um, that I find a lot of, I found a lot of value in was uh, an approach called ultimate exercise or uh, also called body by science by a Dr. Doug McGuff. And he has been kind enough to join us today. I've reached out to him for an interview and he's given us 60 minutes of his time. Um, so, which is perfect because it keeps us concise. And I, I just really appreciate the time talking to you, Doug. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, uh, very welcome, my friend. Um, so I first came across your stuff maybe four or five years ago. And I was a member at a gym at the time, but I was one of those members who was into, I've, I've, this has been the story of my life. It's like this traditional, I go like a new age path and then I come back around to acknowledging that there's, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of value in traditional roots. It's just finding the right way to use it. So I was someone who somewhat um, had a somewhat almost self-righteous attitude of, of snuffing at the uh, people that were on assisted machines and was like, you know, you're not training your balance when you're using those machines and you're missing out on, you know, if you just do free weights or if you if you do pull ups or calisthenics, you're getting a lot more for the body. Um, but you made me help me to see it differently and to look at it with a just in a more of an open minded approach. And when I uh, practice what it just had logic to it. Right. And and I'd also come on from someone who trained under David trained with David Weck, who had a, a similar perspective on how to train the muscle. And it was just about basically stimulating every actin and myosin of the muscle as you go and and not skipping anything and, and and that 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 way you just stimulate the muscles in its full range and you're not skipping anything and that's something um i guess not to jump too far ahead i i'd, I'd love to you to, to to sort of share your things but i'd watched your talk and resistance exercise that many years ago and and i went and trained it in the gym i went and played on the the assistant machines which i'd usually ignore and i couldn't deny within literally two or three sessions i felt um more stability i almost felt like more almost more mobile and supple in certain areas as well and there was just a something i couldn't deny and how quick it happened and how efficient the session was how simple the session was to organize for myself that i was like oh there's really something to this and so i'm grateful again for the time here if you could just briefly share how how you came across this approach and what this approach is just in a, a real summary and then we can get to some more stuff Ooh, well how so i, I know that's i know that's a lot yeah yeah, and how I came across it goes way back in time. Um, so when I was a teenager in high school, um, I was a bicycle motocross racer, BMX, and during the early days of the sport. And I just happened to be out doing sprints one day and um, saw this really muscular middle-aged gentleman kind of jogging around the track. And I just struck up a conversation with him. And it turned out that... Um, he had just opened one of the Nautilus studios back in the 1970s. And Nautilus exercise machines were invented by a gentleman named Arthur Jones, who's kind of the father of this kind of training. Um, and I went over to see this place and worked out on the equipment, was blown away by it. Um, couldn't afford to go there, so I bartered janitorial services to be able to go to this gym. I trained using these high intensity training principles and my performance in BMX racing got much, much better to the extent that um, I did really well. I was able to race professionally. And so my interest in it stuck. Um, and as this training approach evolved, it became more and more um, refined. Ultimately, one of the employees of this Arthur Jones was a gentleman named Tim Hutchins that um, directed a research project in the 1980s called the Osteoporosis Project, and they came up with this protocol of lifting the weights very slowly so that they would um, limit acceleration forces in frail women with osteoporosis. And what they accidentally or serendipitously found out was the rate of result was much, much better. And they came to find out that by eliminating the acceleration, you also therefore place the muscle under a continuous and uninterrupted load. And that augmented motor unit recruitment and motor unit fatigue, which turned out to be the major stimulus 
that makes your body adapt. So when you have to, when you fatigue muscle continuously and you have to recruit more and more muscle or more motor units and you fatigue those out, that produces a very deep level of fatigue. So you went from 100 units of capability down to 40 in a short span of time. Well, that is perceived by the body, the organism, as a huge threat because you threaten movement. And movement's our most preserved biological function. Without movement, you can't get food and you can't keep from becoming food. So it's heavily defended. So if you do an exercise protocol that safely invokes that level of fatigue, then you have a very powerful stimulus for muscular adaptation. And that doesn't require, um, it, really what it does require is just understanding what the proper muscle and joint function for a given movement is. And then just doing that movement with stability so that you are focusing on recruitment and fatigue and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So where people get led astray when they start thinking about training their muscles and then having certain skill sets is there's needs to be a very sharp distinction between physical training and skill training. So physical training is just a matter of um, using a pro protocol that very effectively loads, recruits, and fatigues muscle. And skill training is very, very specific. So whatever skill it is you want to acquire, you should do that by rehearsing exactly that skill. And the problem is, is that you're trying to invoke fatigue with physical training and nothing else. With skill training, you're trying to encode skill patterns while avoiding fatigue because fatigue will create multiple different pathways for that particular skill set and undermine the acquisition of the skill. So skill training and physical training need to be two separate entities. And once you do that, then you can get the best of both worlds. Yeah, I, I that's one of the points I really like because for me, I see it, we have this, we call it both sides utilize effect where, yeah, you can end up just towing the line in the middle and not really hitting too much of either. Whereas it, I always say it's like a, a tent pole like if you want to secure a tent, you need to put that peg as far, the furthest away that tent, that peg is, and the furthest away that peg is, the more secure. So the more you can focus on those two extremes separately, the stronger the the central piece will be. So like you say, focus on your skill and then focus on that strength training. You're just doing it efficiently and effectively in the, in this manner. Um, right. Just, just what, and, what are you, sorry, go on. Well, it's, that's how specific skills are. Um, I just watched the Netflix doc documentary on the Redeem team, mm -hmm. uh, the United States uh, basketball Olympic team after they lost in 96 and 2000, 2000 for the, the team that was going to win back the gold. And one of the major problems that, you know, they recruited all these NBA players was the Olympic basketball was different than an NBA basketball. Mm -hmm. So the rubber stripes on the NBA basketball, there's six of them. But on an Olympic basketball, there's eight. And it ever so slightly changes the mechanics of the ball. But the thing is, wow. the more slight the mm. difference, the more it befuddles the skill. So you can take an NBA player, and if you raise the height of a hoop by three quarters of an inch, it will totally screw them up. <laughs> but if you raise it by six inches, if the difference is big enough, then they can adjust for that. But if it's a very small change Not in you, skill yeah. set, it really befuddles things. So you're right about having the two tent stakes. Mm. Skills are very specific and you need to keep them widely separated so you mm. don't get conflating neuromotor pathways to confuse your skill mm. um, performance. Yeah, I mean, it is, for me, it's a bit of a gray area because part of what I focus on is pattern training with with the rope flow, which is something I don't, I, I think, you're not uh, you're maybe you've just briefly seen on it since since we've talked i'm not sure mm -hmm. but um i have heard you talk about people you know hitting sledgehammers onto tires and stuff and how it's and I, and i i completely get what you're saying with that that um there's this you're kind of confusing two things there it's, there's a function to it 
but I, I see a lot of people at the gym where they're almost just like cooking themselves, but there's no real focus and direction. They end up just in this middle gray area and they're not really doing enough strength training or even car they're doing this mid level cardio. And then, so they're not going high intensity with the cardio. They're not doing low intensity and they're not doing high intensity with the strength and they're not kind of going. So there's a lot of people just end up in this kind of log jam in the middle where there's not much specific specificity with it. Um, I just wondered if you could speak on that because I, I, I think you've got a point to share on that as well with the, you know, just people that train and they're just sort of cooking themselves and they're going through these functional movements, but it's not always functional is, is a, a very open-ended word, so to speak. Yeah. It depends on what you're actually going after. Now, if we're talking about physical training to improve um, physical capacity, work capacity, then by definition, you have to do something of sufficient intensity to trigger an adaptation. Um, if you're doing something repetitively that's well within your current capabilities, there's no stimulus to adapt. Um, you Great have point. to really push the limits with intensity to challenge your current level of capabilities and try to exceed it. That is what's going to invoke a depth of fatigue that is going to demand an adaptation from your body. But make no mistake, it's not the exercise that produces the change. That's simply the stimulus, but you've got to cross a certain stimulus threshold for your body to then adapt. But again, make no mistake, the exercise does not directly cause anything except injury, but it does not directly cause a beneficial change in the body. The exercise is a threatful stimulus. And if that stimulus crosses a certain threshold, the body adapts by making a functional improvement to protect itself against that negative threat. Mm. So you do have to, if you want improvement in any area, you have to challenge your current capabilities for the body to perceive it as enough of a threat to make a physiologic adaptation. But having done that, you then need to allow your body adequate time to make the adaptation. Yes. So you yeah. need time to generate the enzymatic changes in your biochemistry to upregulate your metabolism. You need the time to synthesize new tissue de novo. Um, and if you bring the stimulus back to the body before it's made its adaptation, you will interfere with the adaptation and retrogress. So recovery is also an important component, but if you haven't crossed a certain stimulus threshold, the recovery is meaningless. You've got to have done something that demands the adaptation. On, on that note, can I sort of play devil's advocate and just pose the question to you about what I, I think Pavel Suzzolini coined the phrase grease the groove. And I don't know if you've been asked about it before. I don't think I've seen anything, but I'm, but I'm sure people would have asked you about it. But I've experimented with that where I've not gone to failure on sort of pistols and, and push-ups, but I've done it repetitively throughout the day. And I felt like I felt some positive adaption. Um, what would your yeah. take be on that? What you're doing when you're greasing the groove it is not physical training, it is a skill training. Okay. So if you are, if you gotta go to boot camp for a military academy and you need to be able to do 25 chin-ups, well, you need the functional strength, you need to strength train so with weight go to failure and have skeletal muscle improvements. But to make the most of that skeletal muscle's capacity in a given movement, then greasing the groove, what you're doing there is you're beating a neuromotor jog trail to optimize the function of that particular movement. So stated differently, you can grease the groove for chin-ups and your chin-up performance will improve. But if you grease the groove for chin-ups, it's not gonna do a thing for your push-ups. Hmm. Yeah. You gotta do grease the groove for the push-ups. That is skill training. So skill training is going to be submaximal effort that avoids fatigue, but encodes the neuromotor pathway of efficiency over and over and over again through rehearsal. Okay. So that's the problem is people are continually conflating physical training and skill training because in some degree they overlap, but the intent is entirely different. 
physical training is purely oriented towards fatigue with no concern for skill. And then the strength adaptation and the conditioning adaptation that occurs from that can be applied to any skill. But the development of that skill is through skill rehearsal, which involves appropriate repetition and avoidance of fatigue. So it's a completely different thing. Okay. No, thanks for clearing that up. I think that's, that's a great answer. Is there a reason, briefly, why you um, call it physical exercise rather than strength or physical training rather than strength training? Well, it is strength training, but what I'm saying is that physical training is to produce a generic, broad based physiologic adaptation. Skill training is to take that broad based application and refine it to demonstrate a specific skill. Mm -hmm. And cool. that requires, the problem is, is most people conflate the two and try to combine them together. So you'll see, like for instance, I see BMX racers now, when they do their rate training, a lot of them are doing power cleans because they think it mimics the movements of BMX and the motor groups involved in BMX. Yeah. And then that's going to improve their performance when really it doesn't. You're not, because it's ballistic and lots of momentum is involved, the muscle is discontinuously loaded. You're not really fatiguing the targeted musculature in a way to produce an adaptation. And then the skill you're developing is very specific for power cleans but it does not translate into snapping out of a gate or a gate start or sprint power. They don't directly transfer. I don't know, you're probably not old enough to ever remember watching MTV sports, but it was a sports program for all the different types of extreme athletes. And, you, you know, they would take skateboarders and let them try, you know, slalom water skiing where they take skateboarders and take them out surfing, thinking, oh, they got all these generalized skills. Similarities. Yeah. It does not translate. Yeah. You cannot take a BMX trick rider and have them do any sort of skill on a skateboard or vice versa. You can't even take a BMX trick rider and very successfully have them translate into mountain bike trick riding because the, the skills are super, super specific for that thing. So skills are specific and don't translate in a general way. So when you try to incorporate skill training into your strength training, you just make both worse. Mm -hmm. Can I ask them on that? Because it's kind of relevant for me at the moment is I'm exploring a bit of juggling as coordination training. Now, I'm not a boxer, but I, I do see, I mean, uh, Andre Usyk, who's the heavyweight champion, I've seen him standing on a Swiss ball juggling would you say that that's doing nothing for him or is that, I mean, this might be a different avenue, but it, I just wonder your take on that as like, that's kind of coordination the training. But I, is the, the motor learning research says there may be some transfer, hmm. but the degree of transfer would pale in comparison just um, to simply doing the specific skill of his sport. Cool. Yeah. So if it's a boxer, um, his reaction time and his, uh, you know, his hitting velocity, whatever it is that you think is valuable in the performance of that sport would be much better refined mm. by doing that particular sport. Mm. Though I, I guess that um, the, the other aspect for juggling in that is the neuroplasticity of the kind of left and right sides. So there's, there's other things going off rather than just directly the coordination there may be training is is the brain harmonization or some, something that, that might be and I don't know if you if you're I, don't I mean that may be in theory. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there's hard data to say that that yeah. translates in practice. Yeah, that, here's that's... the thing: is when you're talking about really high level athletes, you're talking about people that genetically have a level of neuromotor function that's off the chain. So you can have them do all sorts of things that appear to provide improvement because on a neuromotor basis, their skills are much more broad-based than the general population. So 
if you have a drill where the Formula One driver is hitting the little board with the flashing lights yeah. to improve their reaction time, might work for that guy with that particular genetic predisposition that even allows him to be a Formula One driver. Okay. You take me or you <laughs> and try to make us a better Formula One driver by doing those sort of drills, <laughs> it's like pissing in the ocean. <laughs> we don't have the neuromotor wiring that even allows us to function at that level. That's why these high-level athletes that are at the very pinnacle of their sport, courtesy of their genetics, can appear to do all sorts of things that provide improvement for them because, um, you know, I got a friend that is a coach for collegiate, a strength coach for a collegiate basketball team. And I asked him what it's like. And his response to me is like, Doug, it's Jurassic Park is what it's like. These people physiologically are on just a different level that cannot be reached by any level of training. It is talent. Mm. So if you have enough neuromotor capability to drive a Formula One car and not crash it into the wall, you, by definition, have the neuromotor capability to do all sorts of agility drills that seem like they might improve your performance in F1, but really maybe the vast majority of that is you're just demonstrating your neuromotor superiority <laughs> as yeah. a freak of our species at baseline. Mm. Now, if you could do those sort of drills with me or you, and then we end up on the Formula One circuit as a result, then I got something to listen to. I hear you. That's a, that's a very good point. <laughs> um, so just back to Arthur Jones, who you mentioned briefly, I it took me a while, but I finally got around to getting Nautilus Bulletin on my uh, Kindle. And I, I tell you, I flew through it. I was really, the way he wrote it, the logic, the approach, the chapters, it, it really drew me in. And it was, I thought it would be like a booklet and it was a lot longer than I'd yeah. first anticipated. And I started on two and I'll admit my uh, my uh, curiosity waned by that point, but I went deep down an Arthur Jones rabbit hole, ended in a Mike Mentzer rabbit hole. Um, but I, I watched all the interviews I could find with him on YouTube. I watched all the, the videos and I tell you, I kind of, I fell in love with the Nautilus machines, the the cams, the logic of it, the way that it, it you know, it adjusts the curvature of of the, the strength curve to match the muscles and stuff like that. I just, I just want to share some appreciation for that. And and is, yeah. is there anything like Nautilus now? I know you work with Medex. Are they close to what Nautilus wants? Well, I've never yeah. experienced so a Nautilus machine, but Medex was a company that Arthur Jones um, started after he sold off Medex in the 1980s. Nautilus. Yeah, and Medex was originally generated to produce medical machines for rehabilitation of the lumbar and cervical spine, but then he built an exercise line. Hmm. And um, that's still kind of state-of-the-art equipment. An engineer called Clay Steffi designed all that equipment. And one of the major things with Medex is that all of the weight stacks of the machine move only 12 inches. Um, so even someone that trains in a sloppy fashion, because the stroke length is so short, it's hard hmm. to generate much acceleration forces using that equipment. Great, yeah. It makes certain that the muscle is aggressively loaded and it's hard to hurt yourself because you cannot get the weight accelerated very much. It's really um, smooth and fluid. It makes it ideal for a more sophisticated training approach like, you know, like what we're advocating mm. here. Mm. So I want to, th this was one of my, I'll get to one of my big conversations because I'm, I'm on time and I'd love to go deeper into this stuff. What what I found when I've when I've done this approach to training and I was doing 10 seconds each way, which is what you kind of prescribe, although I know you're quite open to the, the person finding their own uh, rate of mm -hmm. movement with that. And I started to adapt and some depending on the machine and the exercise and I, I that would I'd start to be more intuitive with how I'd approach it. One thing I found that really blew me away that that I, I feel like I got the most out of this and what you you led me to was there would be moments throughout a movement and it could be on a horizontal pull on the horizontal row. It could be on the leg press. There would be a moment of that full range where I would start to feel these kind of tremors in my muscles. 
and and it would be like a sticking point and I'd and I'd slow down for that period or and then eventually I got to a point where sometimes I'd just hang out in that period where those tremors were occurring and sometimes I'd kind of I don't know intuitive maybe not the right word but I'd follow a, a, a sense in my body of of the motion it might be really slow and it might be a 20 seconds and it might only be a third of the full range and I'd explore and then I'd you know I might be there for one to two minutes exploring this position and and what I've started to do was just to do that in my sessions was just to purely seek out the the positions where I felt that instability but with the right the tracks of the the motion because it wasn't like a I wasn't hanging on a chin-up bar where I could freely swing that so it felt like it really locked me into this position where I could find my instability and I could I could work around it myself but it felt like that was almost the most beneficial in terms of uh, rehabilitation for my body rather than going through the full range of motion and just counting out the seconds was to feel in my body seek these tremors and just hang out there and over session after session I would notice there'd be a lot less tremors in those same positions and and I, I just wondered what your thoughts or take on that that was I'm sure you've experienced a lot of people with yeah. that so what you're doing there is um, you kind of instinctually and intuitively honed in on the real purpose of um, the exercise. And most people, when they go in the gym, they are focused extrinsically. They are thinking about doing something to the weights with their muscles. Yes, yes. What we're going after is not performance. We're not trying to make the weight go up and down as many times as possible. We're using the weight as a tool to load the muscle, to produce rapid and deep fatigue. So on every movement, even if it's canned in a really idealized piece of machinery, there is a, there is a point in the range of motion usually due to joint angle issues where there is a sticking point where it's harder than everywhere else. At that point in the range of motion, you were going to most aggressively recruit motor units. So in a given targeted muscle, a motor unit is say a thousand fibers scattered homogeneously throughout the muscle, innervated by a single nerve, like a wire going to a spark plug. Well, you have like a thousand different motor units in this muscle, all spread about homogeneously, each with their own nerve. Those are all firing in rapid, random fashion, like the pistons of your car, like an eight cylinder car. But when you get in that mid portion where you're really aggressively loading the muscle and it can't escape from the load and the fatigue, what's happening is you're recruiting more and more motor units and fatiguing them. And those motor units drop out. And as those motor units drop out, it's like you're pulling the plug, like you're pulling a spark plug on your car. So when you go from eight cylinders down to four cylinders, the rapid firing is no longer enough to make it smooth movement. So it'll be slower because you got fewer motor units. It's like you pulled a spark plug and now the engine's running rough. That's the tremor that you felt you're actually demonstrating the falling out of motor units at that particular portion of the range of motion because the fatigue is so aggressive. Mm. Over time, you get stronger. So in that sticking point, you're not knocking out as many motor units as you were previously. So you're able to smooth that out because you don't have as few motor units firing at that point. So what you did was kind of the correct thing is you were focusing it intrinsically. You were not using your muscles to do something to the weight. You were using the weight to do something to your muscles. Exactly. Yes. And that's key. And that is very yeah. key to understanding what you're doing in the gym because you get your ego tied up in the extrinsic. Yeah. How much weight can I make go up and down 10 yeah. times? That's not the issue. It's how can I use the weight to in continuous fashion, load and fatigue the muscle. If you're doing it better, you may get less reps. It may look less impressive on paper, but what you've done internally is actually more beneficial. Wonderfully well said. That that I mean that I'm, that's really I didn't know what your take, but that really uh, cements home what I've been doing, and and um, because I feel quite 
I've got a, the, the School of Biomechanics who I share this with, and some of them have, have been trying it as well and getting some good results, but it feels like a real, uh, lo almost lonely, you know, like, because I'm, I'm, I'm almost trying to choose the lightest weight I can still stimulate some fatigue with rather than the heaviest weight, because mm -hmm. I can put a heavy weight on and I can feel my body lock up to make it happen. But I'm right. like, what's the lightest weight throughout this range? And if there's any point in this range that finds that stimulating, then I'm good. I'll stick with that weight. And then I can up it and hit, maybe hit a different part and fatigue a different part. But I, w I was finding that when I would go and just do um, the five, you know, the vertical and the horizontal push pull and the, and the leg press, and I'd explore with some of the positions as well, I could very easily, and that, this might be a different part of my uh, a health issue for me, or it might be my age, or I, I don't know what it is. Um, but I, I would feel, or, or my ability to recruit, I'm not sure. I would feel very fatigued for like two or three days and it would like di diminish my ability to like to want to function on a computer to be able to do the work that some days I would have no problem doing after the day after an intense when I would go high intensity I would struggle with that whereas when I started doing this and just going let me not chase um, a weight and a certain amount of reps or anything like that let me just explore these positions and listen in my internally to my body and let the 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 weight, as you said, the weight to stimulate the muscle rather than my muscle to move the weight, let that happen. I was able to come out of the sessions and actually feel refreshed and actually feel like more grounded mm -hmm. in my body and and and, and not overburnt. I just wondered your if that's yeah. yeah so in this field, they refer to the result of proper exercise being what's called inroading. And inroading is the percentage weakening of your muscle at the end of the set. So if your muscle starts out 100 units strong, if you continuously load the muscle and fatigue it at the end of the set, you may have decreased your strength by 60%. Um, and then there's outroading. And outroading is when you're extrinsically focused. You may select the weight that's too heavy, and then you may use bracing yes. of the muscles and using the bone on bone tower of locking up your joints to be able to demonstrate a better extrinsic performance. But in so doing, you are throwing out a lot of extra energy that is not being directed towards the stimulus. Ah, okay. So you can do an upper body chest press exercise and deeply fatigue the muscle with not a large amount of mechanical work being done and not a large amount of extrinsic force being spent on the body. Or you can take a sledgehammer and beat a tractor tire with it. That's not targeting any specific muscle group very directly. It's not producing a depth of fatigue that's going to result in an adaptation, but you've done an ass load of mechanical work mm. and you've transmitted very high forces to your body. That is difficult to recover from. Mm. Someone that's oriented extrinsically, that is just trying to make the weight go up on that last rep by hook or crook by any means possible, is outroading a lot of extraneous energy and they are consuming a lot of neurotransmitter from the motor strip of the brain through the spinal cord all the way down to the motor end plate of the muscle. That exhaustion of neurotransmitter for no productive purpose will leave you fatigued for days. It gives you what we in the field call robat. And that stands for run over by a truck. <laughs> So yeah. if you are outloading, if you're extrinsically focused, if you're trying to make the weight move by any means possible, you're going to expend a lot of energy that is not delivering the adaptive stimulus to the body. Mm. And that's going to leave you for two, three days feeling like hammer dog shit. Cool. So so that's great because I, I feel like my approach at the moment, it's going to be a longer path to be able to lift heavier weight if that's my goal, but when I, if, and when I get there, I will have so much more foundations in place because of going through the lighter right. weights and working through the. And, and here's the key is when you're talking about this intrinsic focus yeah. versus the extrinsic focus, um, 
we are trying to build strength when we're working out. We're not trying to demonstrate strength. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. So really, put... to, uh, to me, when I'm training clients, when I'm training myself, the weight really doesn't matter. The weight, and my clients are blinded to the weight that they're using. Mm. The weight is just a mechanism to load the muscle to aggressively recruit and fatigue motor units. And increasing the weight in and of itself doesn't necessarily accomplish that better. If it gets them to feel panicky and all of a sudden they're using bracing techniques yeah. and grunting and jabbing at the weight that results in discontinuous muscular loading, then the stimulus and the building of strength is compromised hmm. in order to demonstrate strength. Okay. That's, that's why weight training has always had this weird dichotomy because most weight training with a barbell, the barbell is such a, you know, it goes straight down to the center of the earth. It's relatively inefficient for loading the structures you're trying to train. So as a consequence, you got to put a disproportionate amount of weight on a barbell when you're doing a squat in order to transmit any meaningful load to the hip and thigh musculature. So it looks cool because you're putting these plates that are as big as manhole covers on the bar, and it's a lot of weight, but what's actually getting delivered is load to the targeted musculature because of the inefficiency of the mechanics is actually quite small. But with a properly designed piece of equipment, you can be using a lot less extrinsic weight, but the loading on the musculature is way, way better. If you don't believe that, just go lean up against the wall with your hips and knees at 90 degrees and do a wall sit for as long as you can. In the last 10 seconds of that, that'll be harder than any set of squats you ever did. So the, the extrinsic load has a visual impact that people kind of get fixated on, and that makes them become extrinsically rather than intrinsically motivated. But uh, if you know what the stimulus is and what you're going after, then you can be intrinsic in your training and not get sucked into these misbehaviors. No, I, I love it. And it just really speaks to, I don't know if you can hear, there's a, my neighbors decided to uh, <laughs> stop. I'm not, yeah, I'm not hearing it too bad. Oh, you're not, you're not hearing it. Okay, cool. I'll we'll stay where yeah. I am. Okay. So like they got a blower going or something? It's pretty, yeah, blower or a trimmer. I'm not sure what it is, but it's pretty loud, but I can, I can still focus. Um, That's the end of my existence, man. Cool. <laughs> I bet. Um, So that's what I really liked about Arthur Jones' approach and just the logic of like, when you lift a barbell, you've got one direction against gravity, whereas a, you know a muscle moves with rotation. And when you use the assistive machines, you're allowed you can allow for that. But I don't want to get too. I'd like to. I'd like to keep yeah. this moving a little bit. Um, I, just on on a whim, on an off chance that you might have heard of him, because you you talked about, you know, if you put on a heavy load and then you're bracing the whole body and you're not necessarily recruiting the muscles directly for that action, you can be over recruiting other muscles just to keep the body safe. Have you heard of a guy called Maxic? Is it a 1900s? Yeah, yeah, the the turn of the century guy with the muscle control and everything, yeah. Muscle yeah. control guy, yeah. And I, I got really deeply into him uh, last year. And he, if, his book's quite small. I don't know if you read that one on muscle control. And the logic of his approach was purely about the it was being able to control the muscle for the action rather than, again, focus on an external stimulus. It was first master the ability to control the muscles and then you can start to move weight but that he also said wow. you might need you might need weight and resistance to stimulate in the beginning to be able to feel the muscles but once you can understand and internally feel what's going on then you're able to just do so that his his kind of routine is just without any weights it's just contract the muscle and nourish the muscle you know send blood flow to the muscle and then it will stimulate it to growth um, and then you can apply that to strength performance but in itself you didn't need weight to grow strength or heavy weights but you could oh. I've never, I didn't read his book, but I've heard of him and I've heard stories of, you know, bodybuilders in the late 1800s and turn of the century that kind of followed his approach um, were able to train very effectively with little or no weight. Yeah. Because, you know, if 
it's almost like an almost pure intrinsic form of training. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this, this slower approach to training that we're using with, it's not, not so much focused extrinsically on what the load is, you know, um, Ken Hutchins, the super slow, um, guy, the inventor was like, this is like, um, Tai Chi with weights, you know, and, uh, but, but the max thing, the, the muscle control thing was always fascinating to me. It was amazing the things that he could do. You know, I, I've seen old films of people using that technique and, you know, the weird vacuums and things that they could do with their abdominal muscles. And, you know, the vacuums you know, is a big part of the it. Waves, yeah. The circulations that they could produce and everything was, was yeah. incredible. So, so I experimented with it and I, I built some, I wasn't looking to build size. I built size. I feel like my mind muscle connection imp improved. Like I feel like I could, was more sensitive to it. And when I tensed it, I could feel more presence in the muscle. But what I wasn't able to do was when I went, when I do the the slow weight, the the ultimate exercise type stuff. And when I find my, the, the tremoring that I'm able to find, I'm not able to stimulate that with just purely. And I, and I, I wonder if, if, I mean, they they were had a lot less foam I shoes think and things. Is because you drop motor units out of the equation, um, you just have less grist for the mill. Then, so you know, you're at the point where you're fifty percent fatigued. Half of the motor units in that particular group of muscles is now fatigued out. So, producing smooth and controlled movement is, by definition, going to be compromised. Mm. Um, so when you're actually involving some continuous muscular loading and you're fatiguing out motor units, your eight cylinder system engine has now had four spark plugs pulled and no matter the amount of mental control from above, the connection at the motor end plate is now 50% of what it was. So it's just going to run rough. There's no getting around it. Well, well I, I kind of, I, I, well, I kind of meant the reverse of that was like, I wasn't able to stimulate whatever I was, whatever the the slow control weight stimulate in me. I mm -hmm. I needed that stimulus from those weights that I can't, like I just don't have the connection to the muscle without the weight. Like the weight helps me find right. it. That if I just stand there and flex my chest, yes, I can make my pecs move, but there'll be sections of it that I can't stimulate without a weight, which would which right. would then you know what I mean? Right. So. You know, you don't have to hit a particular muscle group from a lot of different angles. The key to hitting all the muscle group is the fatigue. Mm. Because you're going to get motor units in all corners of that musculature stimulated if you invoke enough fatigue. Because then you will recruit all the motor units available throughout the entire architecture of the targeted muscle. So, um yeah, you can't mind control your way to that level of fatigue. You can mind control your way to that level of motor control in a muscle group, mm. but you still need the resistance and the loading to um, be continuous in order to invoke the level of fatigue that you need to stimulate mm. that adaptation. Mm. So at least, at least in it's, the... it's necessary, but not sufficient, in other words. Yeah. And I mean, maybe it's something that could be developed to a point when, and, and I feel like there's a lot of recovery going on because I've spent years doing free running and parkour and handstands with no awareness on biomechanics. There's no discipline in the sense that if you go to martial arts or gymnastics, they will teach you to do things with a certain form that respects biomechanics so then you can get the most out of it. In my practice, it was very free freestyle and free flowing that I, I put strains on my body that created niggles and stresses and I've got imbalances. I feel I've got imbalances in my muscles that when I do um, this kind of training, it helps to recorrect those imbalances and stimulate me in, a, in a, a more even way and finds the weaknesses that I've not. So I feel like a lot of this work really for me is still doing a rehab, re rehabilitation, basically. But that maybe there's a point where where you can get to where you're able to not have to. You can do it without weights like Maxic, but still build incredible strength. Yeah, and the thing with doing something like parkour or, or sports like it is that it's not um, a reliable, reproducible skill set like gymnastics is. Um, there are specific skill sets that are reproducible and rehearsable. In parkour, 
the environment so stochastic and so random that what you're really training is the ability to deal with the unpredictable mm. and the ir the unreproducible. Um, we say adapt so to over adapt to overcome is one of the phrases for parkour. Right. So the, the the downside of that is it's unavoidable that you're going to get in circumstances that you can't fully compensate for. So you are going to have little niggles and injuries and stuff like that because it's not a specific skill mm. as you've rehearsed over and over again. A dismount from a pommel horse is a specific skill that can be rehearsed over and over again. Jumping from one roof to another and landing is different every time you do it. There, there is, but there is, there is certain like we jump between two walls and we'd call it a precision, and it's like a standing jump. And you'd know right. your limit, and you'd find different jumps. And maybe you know, like with the basketball net, it might be six inches more drop or three inches further, and there'd be nuance. But the 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 the, the full recruitment, you you have to do. In many instances, there's a full recruitment of the body or whatever you're able to recruit because you're putting all of your power into that expression to to make the jump. So, but I, I see what you mean. There is a there is a lot of nuance and differences and everything. Right. So it is the ability to adapt is a big part of yeah. it. But I I still think there are certain biomechanical principles with feet placement and things that I grew up quite duck footed and there might it might not be the best thing. I I couldn't if I just intellectually move my feet straight. I'm not saying that would have fixed it because there you know you're going to put other stresses at other angles. But certain athletes have naturally got straighter feet and they have more long have had more longevity than me and for whatever reason there's there are certain things that 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 play out. You know, you can have bow legs and if you're putting a lot of stress and your knees are inside that, that you can create certain issues. But I I think the root of some postural issues uh, can go far beyond just how we've what we've hammered into our body and there's certain emotional things that play with that as well which goes a lot yeah. deeper into a younger age um so no I've, I've really enjoyed this so far and, and just on that i think the the point about finding the tremors like that, that for me has been so groundbreaking and i think it and it and it makes it the intrinsic focus of going into the gym and and feeling physically feeling because I think a lot of life is in the feeling whether it's emotional or physical and I think how many people walk into the gym and aren't feeling they're just like you say externally focused and they're just going to do a task to count out reps and I just think in nature there isn't this counting out of reps or sets it's more of a feeling when it's done it's done or when it's at the right level when it's cooked it's cooked yeah. kind of thing and, and and that I think the more it's harder to sell a program that way, but I think it's more principle driven. And I think in the long run, it's more of teaching people to fish rather than giving, you know, right. fishing for them. And I think there's also, when you're invoking that kind of fatigue, it requires a lot of conscious mental control because what you're doing is, again, you're threatening your most preserved biologic function. You're training until you can't move the way you can't move. Movement is your most mm -hmm. preserved biologic function. Without it, you can't eat, you can't get food, you can't keep from becoming food. So when that sort of fatigue gets invoked, we have all sorts of instincts that make us want to rebel against that. Set it down, give up, jab at the weight, try to invoke momentum, brace with your bones. But if we have an intellectual override of all those instincts to try to really go after the stimulus intrinsically, um, it's extremely uncomfortable. It invokes a lot of emotion, a lot of panic, um, and it goes against every instinct that we have. But in terms of making um, somatic awareness, it works better than anything because all of that pain, all of that fatigue, and all of that panic activates the limbic system, which is the more primitive portion of your brain where your amygdala is. And there is one synapse between your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex. One synapse, which is why when you do anything, when you're learning any skill or you're doing anything, if you do it in an environment where there is stress and pain involved, it's learned much more quickly and ingrained much more permanently. They call it limbic learning. That's mm. what they refer to and you know, mm. when they're they're teaching special operators and stuff. I mean, you can talk all day long about, you know, in jiu-jitsu, you don't want to get arm barred, but once you get arm barred, <laughs> because of the pain involved in the limbic learning, then you've really learned the lesson. Yeah.
Yeah. And oh, that's kind of training really is limbic learning in terms of somatic awareness, mm. um, stress and recovery. Um, it develops in your body the spidey sense like nothing else can. Mm. Well, I think that's kind of similar with with rope flow. We say the rope's the teacher because sometimes it will hit us on the leg and it will give us a whip. And therefore, you know, next time I need to rotate a little bit more when I'm lazy about that rotation. I get this smack. So the body the body kind of learns itself. So I didn't limbic learning. I, li I like that uh, as an expression. Um, have Just a quick one as well. Have you heard of Dr. Paselli's work with uh, tr trauma release exercise? Or, I think and it's about yeah. it's about um it's it's a kind of therapeutic but you you get very internal on the inner thighs and you get these tremors he talks about in nature when animals have store trauma they store it in the body and when there's a safe environment they, they they go take themselves to a safe place and they just start shaking and it allows the trauma to dissipate and so and i don't know if it was him or somewhere else they, they claim that and it may be the vagus nerve but that the the parasympathetic system is connected to a lot of our internal action so the internal the, in, the inner thighs and that store and when we're able to set it off in this uh tremor that the body then once it feels safe to release it starts to tremor and shake and it's supposed to release a lot of physical trauma from the body uh you kind of lie on your back with your legs bent and you kind of just lift your hips so that there's some tension on the inner thighs and yeah. eventually so you get flexion posturing yeah and then you kind of get once it starts tremoring, then it just kind of takes away from its from itself. But I just wondered if you heard of that because there it's something in the tremoring and in this parasympathetic internal thing going off. But I just wondered if you if you I haven't heard of it, no. but no. you know, intuitively your description of it makes sense to me. Yeah. I mean parasympathetic tone is expressed through fetal positioning mm. or flexion uh, positioning of the trunk. Uh, it's okay. also the positioning of submission. If you see dogs in a pack together, the one It'll roll on its back and get in that flexion posturing, whereas sympathetic dominant posturing is extensor posturing. Yeah. So there's um, something yeah. in in that. So people that are locked in a lot of fear have that position. And that's, you yeah. know, when when we get this. Um, and and then just to, to finish off, because I know we I want to, you know, honor the time. We've only got a few minutes left. Uh, I wanted to ask your thoughts on David Weck. I'm obviously uh, uh, and I, I'm totally open to whatever you want to share. I know you'd said you've only looked into him very briefly. If, if there's nothing you've got to say, then that, that's absolutely fine as well. But um, um, say that again. Thoughts on David Weck. Uh, we I mentioned him briefly, and I know he um, you, he the venter of the Bosu ball and some of the stuff that I'd done. I don't know if you look if you hadn't looked at it, that's absolutely fine. But you said you shared some different theories on than him. Oh yeah. And him. Um, so again, what I would say is that. Um, I think from a physical training standpoint, the more stability you have so that you can focus intrinsically on using the weight as a tool to stress and rapidly fatigue the musculature from a physical training, from a skill training standpoint, um, that is a completely different thing. And yeah. I think the skills are very specific. I don't necessarily think that balance training on unstable things in the vast majority of the population translates in a general sense. It translates in a specific sense um, for that specific skill. If you want to be really good on balancing on a BOSU ball or you know a, a board on a roll or anything like that, you can develop that skill, but it's not necessarily that that skill is going to translate generally into other specific skills. Could that not then you don't think that could build stability into the body? Say one-legged balancing on a BOSU ball, would they not stimulate the, the some supportive muscles around the knees in a different way to a leg press, say? or um, Indirectly, yes, and to a limited extent, yes. Okay, yeah. Um, but I think that if, you know there are dynamic muscles and there are stabilizer muscles, but really every muscle in the body can be either dynamic or stabilizer, if you want to target stabilizer muscles, there are movements that can do that and you can do it in a way that actually loads them and fatigue them in a way that they will have a strength adaptation. Um, using, a more, using a machine more than yeah, just yeah. balancing. Okay, cool. I, I, I'm someone who loves balancing. I, I think like that there's a certain, it's a natural way for us to, to develop some certain stability, but I think, it, I'm totally open if you think there's a more direct way using machinery 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you want to talk about strengthening the muscle, there is a more direct way. If you want to talk about the skill yeah. of having balance on an unstable surface, yeah. for that specific unstable surface, you will adapt specifically mm -hmm. to that. But even like a rail, which is a stable surface, but there's still a lot of, um, mm -hmm. you know, coordination and stuff involved in that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, no. I mean, literally, literally to the point that I would bet you, you could do lots of stability training on a BOSU ball and then try to translate that into a rail and they wouldn't necessarily transfer. Yeah, I, I think that's fair because one's your, on the, on the rail, I'm the it's almost the unstable thing. and on Different the, skill set altogether. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. activating stabilizer muscles and things to keep your balance on an unstable surface versus mm. a stable but narrow surface is mm. it's a different motor pathway and a different skill altogether. Mm. I, I I still think there are certain benefits. I don't know what what it in the within the brain or something going off when we are balancing. I think it there's more than just the physical adaptation. I think there's other stuff that is recruited and i think i do feel really believe that there's a reason like children naturally like they have mm -hmm. a urge to go and test their balance i feel like it does develop something oh, yeah, with, yeah. within us yeah. there, there are general skills that that does help with and improve but mm -hmm. um a general broad-based skill of balance won't necessarily translate to a more specific oh. balance I get, I get that completely, yeah. Because I, I love playing on the Swiss ball and, uh, as, you know, the stability yeah. balls. And I think that does a lot for me. But I don't, I can't balance on the Swiss ball and go walk on a slack line. Like there's no, there's not really not much crossover from that at all. I might have some muscles engaged, but the term, the, the crossover is very different. Right. Um, so yeah. there are general balance things, but they do not translate into specific skill set. Yeah. Yeah. And then taking that into sport, I don't see Most that. Most people will not translate into walking across the slack line and vice versa. No, definitely but, not. No. But you can take your general capability of balance to any specific skill set and mm -hmm. refine it. And then that'll work better. If yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, as a skill, as a, as a thing to practice in training, even as a warm up, like I think balance is a great way to warm up because it, it stimulates a lot of different things in a, a quite a gentle way. Um, but I, can't, I will tell you this though, in the final couple of minutes, is like, go for it. If the absolute prerequisite for any balance skill is adequate strength of the skeletal muscle, if the strength is inadequate, no amount of skill training will make up for that in terms of balance. Mm. Elderly people are the perfect example of this. Yeah. Okay. By the someone, time someone is 80 and they have enough skeletal muscle atrophy, if they're standing straight upright, they're going to be okay. You bump them just a little bit and they go off vertical. Yeah. They don't have enough skeletal muscle strength to correct their posture. Yeah. And no amount of balance training in the world is going to help them if they don't have the skeletal muscle strength to invoke that skill. Great. No, I love it. I think you're spot on. I think we we can't overlook strength training as a as a complete aspect of building a strong and stable body. Like you have to focus on some muscular fatigue and muscular strengthening. Um, and yeah. and yeah, great. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed this. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, no, I, I appreciate. It. I tried to have a little bit different conversation because I know you have a lot of the same conversations with a lot of the, you. You give a lot of your time and give a lot of the podcast. No, this I wanted is to... great. I really enjoyed it, and I like no. what you're doing. And thank the you. out there is beautiful. I've enjoyed that as well. Yeah, I'm in Wales. I, I just got here. I'm going to go hike that mountain uh, either today or tomorrow. Um, right, but, have fun. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Where can we we check out your stuff? I'd recommend uh, Body by Science, the um, book. What else? Yeah, if you just go to drmcguff.com, that'll kind of link you up to anything that I do. Great, thanks. Hope to speak again in the future sometime. Thanks, brother. Right, sounds good. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.